I pray today that we just be grateful, Father God, for the lot that we have, the little that we have, that that we don't have. Tonight, we just want to thank you for everything that we're grateful. We thank you for everything you've done, everything you've been ready to do. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the Son, the Holy Ghost. We just thank you. And everything that we do tonight is to bring you to us. Now, our knowledge to increase. So God, allow us to move into the manifestation of the miracle of faith. We love you, Jesus, God. In the name of Jesus, and everyone says, Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are going to read tonight. God saved me. There's lessons on the back chair. You come in on um, Nate. I'm the chair in the back now. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about reigning over your enemy. Some say, reign over your enemy. Reign over your enemy. And I want to make sure that we make it clear tonight that you really don't got an enemy. See, we put so much emphasis into the enemy that we lift him up above God. Because everything that occurs, we glorify the devil. But we're going to learn tonight that the enemy has no position in our life. He's been defeated, and Jesus went to the cross, the Bible gave it here, he went to hell, took the keys from him, and he reigned. So he said, he reigned. The issue is, do you believe God, or do you believe in the crisis that you're going through? That's the concern. Somebody say, that's the concern. So the and lesson today is called Reigning Over Your Enemy. Uh, Pastor Frank is at work tonight, so I thought I'd go ahead and teach something tonight. So I'm going to ask Mr. Teresa just to help us out. Stay with us. Maybe you've been here with me. You guys know how I teach, you know how I preach. Somebody reads, I talk. I'm not being disrespectful, but I'll just cut her off and then start talking. At any time, somebody say, at any time, if you have a question, just raise your hand. And expect to be put on a spot. I have questions for you. Amen? Let's go. Let's read it. Please. Have you ever stepped out to do something for God and met resistance? Perhaps you were slapped down so hard that you didn't have a lot of ambition to get up again. Okay, let me read that again. Listen to what it's saying here. Go. Have you ever? Okay. Um, have you ever stepped out to do something for God and met resistance? How many of you have ever said in your heart, I'm going to give it all to God tonight? I'm going to go full force, I'm going to trust Him, I'm going to believe in Him, but the moment you move into the things of God, the things that, the moment you use the little bit of faith that we have, we get into the things of God, and suddenly everything around us begins to happen. So we say everything around us. From our kids, to our wives, our husband, our jobs, our money, it seems like everything just comes against us. Somebody says, that's what we call resistance. Okay, just keep reading now. So that's just in the back of my mind. And part of the reason that happens is that we forget that we have an enemy. Somebody said one of the reasons that happens is why? Yeah. We what? Yeah. We forget that what? Yeah. We have a what? Yeah. Okay, keep that above, keep that afresh, keep that in your mind right now, so we're going to dismiss the enemy tonight. Read. Anyone in the military will tell you that if you're going to win the battle in front of you, you must know the character, position, and history of your enemy you're about to engage. See, the issue is that we put so much emphasis in what the enemy does, but we don't really get to introduce ourselves to who he is. you got to understand that when you're talking about the military, they're talking about what is the enemy's character. We understand that the devil, Lucifer himself, was an angel, was a Jesus, and said as a soul of God, he began to manifest and wanted to run things, rule things, and just be who he is, even what he's got here today. And, and the, the Bible makes it clear that he passed him out of heaven. And the first thing that, one of the first things that came up about him, God said, this is your world. Somebody said, this is his world. Which means that we live amongst a devil that God gave permission to, to rule. This is his world. This is his habit. That's why it's very important that we get to know his character. What was his character? We understand that he was an angel to praise God. We understand that he was one that was steadfast in God. We knew that the, the, the scriptures make it clear that <clears throat> when he saw that he saw with such a voice that, 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 that even the angels, even the throne of God would vibrate. So we understand that that's one that of his characters. Somebody said that's one of his characters. So when you understand his character, that's why we're moved by music. Uh-oh. 
That's why we're moved by music. That's why when people are having crises that they don't understand who the enemy is, they don't understand his character, and a certain song comes on, all the husband and wife or the boys and the girls and our the family that's together, all they know is that when they heard that song, this is what was going on in their life. Someone said, this is what was going on in their life. How many could hear a song and they take you immediately to where you're at? That's what we do. You know, they, they call it thinking about the old and the good. And, but those songs literally will take you somewhere. Some say somewhere. Somewhere. Keep on, keep on. So in order for us to begin that with Christ, we need to know our enemies. So we must get to know who he is. I want to explain that the Bible tells us to watch out for the devil. The Bible tells you what? To watch out. Watch out for who? Okay, now let me help somebody out tonight. There's nowhere in our lives that the enemy should ever catch you blindsided. Oh, I didn't see that coming. No. We're prepared at all times because we're identifying who he is, we're understanding how he operates, the Bible makes it clear he comes to and fro to see who he might devour. So I say to and fro. So the moment something happens to Pastor Reuben, it's not that the enemy has power over me. I allow him to devour me. I allow him to persuade me. I allow him to suck me in. He can't do nothing without God's permission in your life. Somebody say, stop going around and blame the devil. Someone said he has no room, he has no power over me, my children, my family, and everything that's connected to me. Uh-oh. Keep going, man. Um, okay. I want to explain that the Bible tells us to watch out for the devil. Okay. He's looking for a way to devour you. He's looking for a way to what? Um, so if you just took time tonight or tomorrow within the next few days, Look how the enemy hit you and how he came in. Where were you at? What was going on in your life? Were you in the presence of God? Did you make yourself available to him? So we'll make ourselves available to the enemy. Somebody say, how, Pastor? We begin to dwell in our crisis and think about what we lack and what we don't have. And the Bible says he's looking to see who can come and devour. All he's looking for is a state of mind that he could enter. He can't be beaten, but if he could get into your mind and the state of mind of where you're at, he has now access everything about you. Uh-oh. Be going. Be sober. Be what? Sober. And he's not talking about being sober. He's not saying don't be drinking. That ain't what he's saying. What he's saying, be sober. I mean, be like-minded. The Bible says, Keep his mind that's in you as the mind that was in Jesus Christ. That means that our thoughts are clean. We're not thinking we're not thinking evilness. We're not thinking bad things about people. We're not thinking about how we want to hurt people. Somebody said that ain't being sober. Somebody said that ain't being sober. Keep reading it. Be what? In other words, be aggressive. Don't lay back and wait till the enemy comes in. My pastor said, I don't want to talk to you like you probably hit me like a kid because I was a grown man acting like a kid. And he said, how did this happen? How did this happen, Ruben? He said, let me help you out. You weren't being good, good. You were laid back. You thought everything was good. He said, we have those seasons. Some said, we have those seasons. Mm-hmm. When money's flowing, everything's right. Some say everything's right. And we have a tendency, the Bible says, to become complacent. We relax. We relax. While I'm in this, I know Jesus. Jesus is with me. Hallelujah. We praise Him. We put praise in it. We listen to the word on the radio. We're, We're there. It's not about being there. It's about how consistent do you remain in the presence of God. How consistent. Do you listen to praise music on the way to work on you? Or do you sleep at night with music going on in your bedroom? Do you, do you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is get into the Word? 
Do you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is begin to be thankful. Do you get up in the morning and be grateful? Because I learned in my walk in this journey to heaven for me, there would be days I would get up and be grateful, and there were days I would wake up and say, I wish I wasn't in this world. Somebody said, that ain't me in this world. That means you're not paying attention. You're, all you're focusing on is what's going wrong. It's not about what's going wrong. It's about how good God is to you in the middle of your crisis. In the midst of your crisis. I was talking to a young lady who here visiting us tonight, and she read the scripture up there. She said, be still and know that I'm God. And I remember my pastor, I told her a little story. My pastor told me, one day, I'm going to be like that. And I was looking at him, I thought, oh, I thought you were like that already. He goes, no, I still think. In other words, what he was telling me, there's still some work in me that i got to be able to address. When we can't be still in the things of God, and everything that comes in moves us, come on, somebody say, everything moves us, I'm not in God. I trust you, God, but I don't believe you, God. I want you, God, but I really don't need you tonight, God. We have a tendency to put God on that point in this. We set date nights up with God. And the majority of the time, our date nights with God is when things are going bad. But how many of us tonight could really set up a time with God where we don't bring our crisis to Him, where we don't come complaining, where we don't come up being, not being grateful, especially in a season of Thanksgiving, a season of being grateful. I was praying this morning, and I began to pray about the things that are needed. My wife is ill. We can pray for her. And the Lord said, how about putting that to the side and just be grateful that you still have your wife? Sometimes we just got to be grateful for who God is. But we really don't get to know who God is because we spend so much time in our crisis. My, my pastor would say, you and your wife fight so much that you got no time for God. You already position yourself to a place of defeat. A lot of things happen in our journey when we came to God. It seems like everything that should have got better seemed went worse, got worse. It had nothing to do with God. The Bible makes it clear, charged our God foolishly. I used to cry out to God and begin to almost curse Him because of the things that happened in my life. And there were awful things that happened in our marriage. They were so awful that my pastor had me and my wife do a marriage class. And after the marriage class, some of the husbands came up to me and they said, I will never speak with that. Blah, 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 blah. I thought that was it. But when you begin to think that, and when you begin to identify and take blame, instead of blaming everything else in your life, take a real good look at yourself. You'll see that the majority of the issues started with your mind. We gave at it. We opened up the front door. We closed the front door and we forgot to lock the back door. What's the back door? Your memory bank. The memory bank. The stuff that they stored up. How many of you have been in a relationship that when you get in an argument, or been in a relationship, where you get in an argument and stuff come out from 10, 15 years ago? has nothing to do with right now. That comes from what, 15 years ago? How does that come up? Our relationship with God. God, I give it all to you, so we really don't. God, I trust you. Your word says casting all my cares on you. And we'll confess it, Mama. How many of you have ever confessed that? God, I'm going to cast all my cares on you. Verbally, we say it. But mentally, we don't believe it. And the Bible says, so is the man thinks it, so is he in his heart. So is he in his heart. So that means Pastor Ruben just preached a good message. I could move the whole church. I, I, I could draw people. But the heart. Some say the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this the devil as a roaring lion walking about to bring him to his desire. Look at your neighbor and say, hey. Somebody look at somebody and say, hey. 
Do you know that he's walking around you right now? Right now. Hey, little one. Someone said he's walking around right now? Yes, he is. The Bible says he's walking till he can find a way to devour another word, Teresa. He stays there and he gives him a room. Go to church every day, 31 days a month. I've been to church 30 days, but that one day, that one day I let him in. I said, it's that one day. Devour. Walk you. Come on, we're going to know who the enemy is tonight. Come on, read now. Whom we resist, knowing that the same of blessings are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Someone say, whom we resist. Someone says, resist. In other words, you have the responsibility. Pastor Reuben has the responsibility. The Bible says, there's no way into the song house unless you buy the song house, which means that anything that takes place in my house starts with me. That's with me. And then it falls on my wife. Because we became one. In other words, when I become weak, she becomes my friend. Oh, you're not getting it. Somebody say, you're not listening to me, Pastor. Because everyone has somebody in their life. Paul had Timothy. Ruth had Naomi. Elijah had Elisha. Moses had Aaron. Someone say, who do you have? It's important that somebody's walking with us. Because if you're not ministering the word of God, somebody says, you're open ground. Because the scripture says that when you speak the things of Jesus, even you say in his name, Jesus, that the enemy has to flee. So if I'm not teaching, the scripture says, if you have no disciples, you're not a disciple of Jesus. In other words, if you're not teaching his word, you're not a man. What was he saying? You've got to remain prepared through your ways of teaching, uh, praying, sharing, testifying, and which establishes the strength of your spiritual muscle. Somebody say, my spiritual muscle. And so we say, if the enemy happens to hit you, so we say, if the enemy happens to hit me, and he knocks you off your feet, the faster you get up, it's the faster how fast you're going to overcome. How many of us today in the street, before we come from, I know some of us are older now, but how many of us have come from the street where somebody hits you, you never hit them back? Or if somebody beats you up, how many of you make a couple of phone calls? For us that are old, we'll get a pager. But how many of us have contacted somebody to come and help us? In the same manner, you've got Jesus and the Holy Ghost with you. So when the enemy is messing with you, somebody said, the enemy is messing with you, you have that that you have to call. And somebody said, and you have to call immediately. The scripture says many times in the book of Psalms that when David was under attack, the first thing David would say to his leadership is, bring me the ephod. The ephod represented the tribe of, uh, of Israel. It represented the very presence of God. So when David cried out for the ephod, what he was saying is, bring everything that I know of Jesus and the word so I can go forward in the things I need to do. In other words, after David put the ephod on, he said, now I'm ready. Now I got the word. Now I got the word. The issue is, we don't really want the word. We really don't have time for the word. And I'm talking to me. Working 10 hours at work, we're at 12 right now. We're working at 12. It's not a hard job, but it's stressful. When somebody to the church, by the time I get home, it's not like it used to be about four or five months ago. And then I begin to see the things that are going on in my family with my wife and my mother-in-law. Whoa. I could see what all started. 
I just see what all fun. Because whenever the enemy hits you, it didn't happen there. It was already being processed. He was already working you through something. He was working you. He was working you and working you and working you. Looking to see when that day would come back and devour you. An opportunity. Someone say an opportunity. Excuse me, man. In other words, you're not sitting alone tonight. Somebody say, I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. So my pastor will tell me, because you're a grown man still feeling sorry for yourself. You think you're the only one, woman? You think you and your wife are the only ones? You guys are so busy fighting, there's somebody out there who lost your wife and don't have nobody to fight with. God is with us. Look what he said. Look what he said. No one your brothers and sisters who are reigning beside you. In other words, Sarah, you're my sister. You're reigning here with me. He said, have also experienced the adversary. In other words, there's nothing new other than son. <clears throat> Nothing new. The only difference the enemy has is a different person. But his tactics are all the same. He said, my brothers and sisters, I mean, everybody here has experienced him. Have been hit by him. For some of us, we've been wiped out by him. But the good thing is, we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. We're going to get into that evening. One of the devil's favorite tactics is to magnify your weakness. Wait a minute, wait a minute. One of the favorite tactics of the devil is to do what? So guess what? Whenever you get hit, the enemy exposes you. Right? Don't you ever see people like, we I mean, all got folks. Don't turn over your face this is our business. Right? So we don't want people to know our business. Why? It's because we begin to reveal to people there's things where we are real and we do have weaknesses in our lives. The enemy will expose us. It's not about the alcohol. It's not about the sex. It's not about the relationship. It's not about our children. It's not about the money. His job is to expose your weakness. So when things begin to happen, step back for a moment. Step back. The Bible says when David lost everything in his life, some say his life, the first thing that David did, once again, he asked him for his refund. Then he went to the presence of God. Then he asked God, Can I go, should I go get him? Or do I let him go? And God said, go oh, yeah. In other words, we don't do nothing without God's permission. Just because I'm a good employee and I know how to find a job doesn't mean that every job I find is good for me. Uh-oh. we got to understand that the adversary is looking for opportunity. I don't know about you, but in my walk, Things were going good for four or five years and suddenly, boom. It was like a married girl. It was like almost four years out of time. Four years, four years. He knows your weakness. And he will always expose your weakness. So that you're looking at yourself and your shortcomings instead of your God-given potential. Oh, read that again, yeah. So that you're looking at yourself. Tell me who you're looking at who? Yourself. Okay. And your shortcomings. And your what? Shortcomings. Mm-hmm. Instead of your God-given potential. First thing, all we gotta do is tweak our mindset. Stop dwelling on everything that's gone bad. Start thinking about God's potential in you. What has God said about you? What does God say on the scripture of every scripture about us? 
Nowhere in the Bible did he call us defeated foes. Nowhere. Nowhere. And any time that Israel, the people of God, were defeated, either when they went to Babylon, when they went to Babylon, and they were in, 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 in slavery, the Bible says that God, in the book of Isaiah chapter 45, the Bible says that God took King Cyrus, I'm say King Cyrus, who was an evil man. An evil man. The Bible used the sin in his life. As a matter of fact, if you read 43, 44, and 45, the Bible says that he's now King Cyrus. You know the sin in your life? I made that. He goes, everything that you've done, I allowed you to do that. But what I love about that story, and the reason I brought it up, because the enemy's busy in our lives, but God will allow you to turn out to cause you to come out of the answer. I didn't have that enemy. I didn't have that enemy. Where you imprisoned yourself. How many ever walked in your life? Now, how to be today or maybe in the past? Or you say, man, see that nothing ever changes. Day in, day out. What are you doing to it? He's making you tired of looking at yourself. Change how you see yourself and begin to see how you got to see Begin to see how God sees you. Today we had an awesome conversation in my job. That was a new director and he said, man, so much stuff has been said about you. I said, I hope good. He said, not one thing has been good. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, these people are still focused when he first started with the district when you were completely tattered and being a fool. They don't see you where you're at today. They don't see you what you're doing to. They don't see you who are victims of your name. They still see you what you used to be. And when that begins to happen, I promise you, you begin to see yourself how they see you. You begin to dwell there for a moment. And all the enemy needs is for you to dwell there just for a moment. Just for that moment. Go home. Start reading scriptures in your ears. How God sees you. Quote the scriptures how God sees you. If you're always defeated, put down a scripture on more than a conqueror. Me and my wife, um, growing up in ministry, my wife was, um, um, get, get by the memorizing scriptures. So my whole house was full of faith and scriptures. From the restroom, to the kitchen, to the bedroom, to the closet, to the doors, to the walkway. Because if you don't remind yourself of who God, who God is in your life, somebody says, you're beginning to have problems. Stop pushing God aside. You are who you are today because of God. I'm going to trip somebody up right now. You have been allowed to sin because of God. My that's what my pastor would tell me. I said, you're crazy. Why would you say that to me? He said, because it's grace and mercy, Ruben. Grace and mercy. He's not giving you permission to sin, but because of your sin, he's allowed it because he said it's fun. And I promise you, Jesus' death is not in vain. Without his death, where would we be? Where would we be today? Read. The devil can get you, or someone close to you talking about where you're going to start a time, you will never get into your potential. Somebody say, when the devil can do what? Read that last part again, the first thing. Listen. Uh, if the devil can get you, or someone close to you talking about where you're going to start a time, you will never get into your potential. In other words, hang up on your commandment. Hang up on the busy bee. Not you, yeah. Hang up on those people. Don't you have those kind of people that call you, but they, all they want to do is talk about everybody else's fault. But never one time do they pause and say anything about themselves. Everybody has problems. But those kind of people are being used by the enemy, and the people don't even know that. And some of those people are in the house of God. In the house of 
to God, but we're supposed to love one another, build up one another, but we're acting like fools. Treating us each other like we don't know what we're doing. There's a maturity that we grow up to in the physical realm, which means there's a manhood I gotta grow up to. And so we say the pastor's working on it. <laughs> right? There's a maturity in the physical. But I want to let you know tonight, and I'm gonna to hope to teach this soon. There's also a spiritual maturity. Two different things. Just because you're a grown man and you have kids doesn't mean you're mature. Just because you're a woman and you're a good housekeeper and you do things right and you cook good beans and you know how to make a good burrito, doesn't make you a woman. There's a spiritual maturity that goes alongside of your physical maturity. Somebody say my physical maturity. So that means when we don't got one or the other, we have to grow with both of them at the same time. And somebody said that's a difficult thing to do. Because if you're anything like I used to be, used to, we get childish. We get into the mode poor, slow, little, me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Mama dear don't call me. Sister Mia don't want to see for me. Sister Norma don't even care about me. I'm talking about physical maturity. But I'm talking about spiritual maturity. Knowing who you are in Christ. Knowing the tools and the abilities that you have. In other words, you guys are better than Batman. You have a, you have a spiritual utility belt. You're fucking, uh, I need to use it as a tool. You have all these abilities, but don't know how to use them. How many of you said, I'm more than a conqueror in the church? They open up the church. Who here is more than a conqueror? And the church goes, Rah! Hallelujah! Amen! I'm more than a conqueror! I'm the head and not the tail! Let people that come to church are all defeated. <laughs> the lack of spiritual security. Go home tonight. Sounds crazy because they may need it, and it works for me. Sometimes in our lives, we gotta go back to God and introduce ourselves to Him. And ask Him for forgiveness. Not for what you did. Because your sin has already been forgiven. Your sin has already been what? Forgiven. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do I ask for? Just like I have many times. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for not using what you gave me in this life of mine. Because the scripture makes it clear. There's going to be a time in our lives where we're going to be standing there before God. And what does the scripture say, Teresa? What did you do with that that I gave you? What did you do with it? What did you do with it, Pastor? Somebody said the people that's in your circle are the ones holding you back. Many of us have people in our lives that shouldn't be in our lives. We don't kick them out with some family, some of our children. Right? But you gotta be able to identify. My pastor used to tell me in my life, and this is crazy for me to hear this. I'm glad it came back to me. He said, really? Did you know today is five years after the time you asked me to pray for that back then? Did you know God wanted to answer it, but you don't let him? God, take me out of the situation. You really don't want to get out. God, deliver me from drugs. I come out of a ministry, my pastor, that he didn't believe in any of he didn't believe in any kind of rehab. He believed on the Word of God and the Word of God only. When I came in here, strung out, I was my wife, strung out. And he laid hands on me, I was delivered. Delivered. The scripture makes it clear. That's why it's so important that we understand. Because as long as you know you have a, 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 a 
person that is accepting a whole drug, because when people get on drugs, the first thing we want to do is send them to a rehab. No, you don't send them to a rehab. You send them to what the Word of God says, and you help them believe that. How do you make them believe it? By you believing it. We can't have a preach the Word of God if we have our own hang We become a hindrance. That's why Paul says, who, in the book of Galatians, Paul says to the Galatian church, who bewitched you? Who bewitched you? Sarah, who bewitched you? In other words, what he's saying is, what tripped you up? Who in your life caused you to turn away from me? Who in your life caused you to make that decision? Who in your life, and why did it happen? When you begin to see things that way, like we used to have to see it, you begin to learn that God's hand is on your life. God's hand is on your life. For God to use Paul to say, Pastor Reuben, who be with you? What did he say? Come clean. Come clean. That's what Paul was saying to the people. Come clean. Don't tell me you're delivered and you're still sleeping around. Don't tell me you're delivered and you're still doing this and this and this and that and this and that. That's why he said, who be with you? And somebody say, and disobedience to the Word of God? The Bible says it's like operating in this stuff. So anytime I come against the Word of God, being a man of God, I have now put myself into a different realm. That's why it's so important that we start understanding the spiritual maturity in our lives. That's why it's so important that people begin to teach these things. Because there's nothing wrong about teaching about love, but I promise you that a lot of stuff in love and relationships is a lot of hidden agendas. There's a lot of hidden secrets. I think you say, did you ever cheat on mom? I said, no, because you're cheating, you have to get caught. What was I saying? I did, but I didn't ever listen. But that's how we are in things of God. As long as I'm not caught, I'm good. As long as I don't, as long as my wife don't say nothing, we're good. As long as my husband don't say nothing, we're good. But what are the hidden things? What are the roadways that the enemy has already made into our lives? Especially an enemy that's already been defeated. It's almost like, like, the devil picking up plants, the guy who fought over there. I knocked you out, but let me pick you up again because I want to fight you again. You already got the bell. You already attempted. I'm trying to remember the number. I think it's 30 cents a cent of Christian to fight the same battle. You watch the whole life? Give me six cents a second. That means three out of ten. Fight the same guy to the same guy. Who is he fighting the same guy? Are they still the same? Are me and my wife still fighting it? Are me and my wife having the same fight when we first met? Are me and my kids having the same battle that we first met? No. I'm not saying there's no fight. But I'm saying is, you got to hold the There's an old song. And I used to love this song. Thank you when I was here to love this song. One day at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. Think about that. Thank you. And the Bible said, if you see it, then I understand. So we never get ourselves to that place. Because we don't understand the end of our lives. It's not that God ain't in our marriage. We just push God out. That's what my pastor would tell me in my life. You know, what if you stop praying for your marriage? We're not praying for your marriage. I was like, what do you mean about praying for my man? I gotta pray for my man. He wouldn't understand that. 
But you pray for your marriage, but then you kick God out. Because you get all happy, you're all hooked good. Got back there when me and my wife are giving each other hickey still. Oh. We'll be all spooky and soon in there. Everything's good. But as soon as there was a crisis, God! Come back. We gotta know our appetite. We gotta know our appetite. We gotta know our enemy. Who do you know? You know what? You know your enemy. Remember the devil doesn't have any real power. We didn't ever say, hey, the devil has no what? Hey, good one. If you have power, you'd be dead. Right? I remember a guy overdosing and he died. And somebody told my pastor, I thought you said the devil didn't have no power. He goes, he doesn't. He chose to get high. We make decisions and we want to blame God. Does the enemy move? Yes, he does. But we're in the house of God. We have a relationship with God already. We're growing. We're maturing. I promise you, whether you stay in this church or go to another church, you're going to continue to grow. You're going to look back in your life and say, really? Really? I tell me and my wife, we were just laughing the other day. I said, we really had to go through all this to get where we're at today? Really? Did you make a thing? Really? Yeah. Really? So he tries to keep us in the darkness of lies and ignorance. He tries to keep us in the darkness of what? Lies Okay. He wants us to agree with his lies. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. He wants you to what? Agree. So when you defeat yourself, so I'm not going to give the devil that kind of credit too much. When you defeat yourself, all you did was agree with the lie of the enemy. In other words, what you did is you established a covenant with the devil. Keep going. Um, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. The people are destroyed from the what? Okay. Can you read it? Lucifer are the devil tries to act like he is fighting against God. Think about this right now. We're giving the enemy so much credit, and we're going to learn tonight that the only, the only thing the enemy needs to do is act like he's talking to God. That's all he can do. Some say act, and we believe him. It's like us going to see those movies. Oh my God, that movie was so neat, and half a movie was fake. It's like us going to watch the rapture. We should get excited with rapping. Right? My 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 godson, her brother, is getting all mad because Eddie what was it? Eddie Guerrero died. And he should be this guy was real. And I was just messing with him and he began to cry. I go, what are you crying for? Rapping is real. But the things that we believe in. Things that we believe in. The enemy's acting like he's a fighter guy. And then he gets to the beginning of the year and he goes, what? And then he says, what are you doing? Think about that. That's a strong word. Ignorance? How about somebody come to chapel and you dummy? Please. God is Lucifer's creator. Oh, wait a minute. God is who? Lucifer's creator. For the creator to fight with the people who Think about that. God created him. Don't That's like you having a son. He is a grown man and he having a son. And that little boy comes and beats me up. No, I hate you, boy. But then you can say it over the window. I brought you into this world. <laughs> And I'll take you out of this world. Same thing. 
God created Lucifer. And for him to think he could challenge God is demeaning to him. In other words, when I believe in the enemy more than I do believe in God, it's a disrespect to God's faith. When I begin to glorify the enemy and everything that goes on around me, I'll try to say that. He say, why do we, the people of God, who are the leaders of the church, go to have the power of prayer, want to go to somebody, and the first thing they want to do is begin to take the enemy in their life instead of praying the goodness of God and the Creator of who He is into their life? We think that everything that comes to the altar has issues. Do you have a problem? Some people that come up here just haven't been introduced to the power of God. Some people that come up here just don't have that kind of relationship with God. But we're praying for them. My pastor said, when you guys are done praying for them, I want to come back to your church. You just told me how much of a drug addict I was. You just told me how, how, how much of an idiot I was, how much of a less of a man than I was. We've got to build people up. I'm not saying don't pray for the crisis, but you don't have to identify people by the crisis. Begin to identify people for what God has made them and their godly potential. My son's never going to change. How many of you ready that? <laughs> oh, my daughter is never going to change. He's speaking of it. You believe in the life of the enemy. Change the conversation. It works. It works. People want to hear how good of a person they are. In the midst of that time. Give me one. The creation is no match for its creator. Mm -hmm. God takes his hands in and takes him or her into the world and gives that person faith to deal with the devil. In other words, the moment that God created me, he said he knew me from the womb of my mother, mama, right? I had the ability already to fight the devil. In other words, when I was just a seed in my father, passed it over to my mother, I never had been fully developed. I already had the ability to enter this world and be the party. But we spend so much time in the church, in our homes, in our families, trying to make ourselves victorious when we're already victorious yet. How many times do you have to talk to yourself? You can do this. You can do this. No, you can't. You already done it. Stop praying against what God has already done. And what am I teaching people pray for healing? Right? God heal. God heal. But the scripture says they already been healed. That's the way we release things into the atmosphere. The Bible says he was beaten down so many times where he was unrecognizable and the shedding of his blood, I was healed. That means my healing is here. The whole time I've always been on the back, I have not prayed God to heal me. I've been glorifying God and saying he's here. I'm not praying against what God has done. You are really victorious. You were born in this world as a victorious woman and man of God. Princess, you are really victorious. But what we do is we teach people to pray and fight. Pray and fight. Pray and fight. I mean, how you guys heard that in church? I'm in spiritual warfare. I'm in spiritual warfare. Well, darn it, give me a break. How long does this to work for their goal? It's been two and a half years. How long? Does it even happen? Yes. Is there spiritual work? Yes. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, there's a principality and there's a war going on world. We don't see it. But there is more that's going on. But do not prolong 
your fight when there's no fight to be won. You're a winner. You're a champion. You're a champion, Robert. You cannot go tell people, I'm going to pray that God give you the victory. Who do you think that God give you the victory? The victory is yours. I'm going to pray that you're an overcomer. Wait a minute. Why are you praying I'm an overcomer? I am the overcomer. I am the overcomer. You are the overcomer. You are the head. You are. It's the confession. The Bible says the power of life is death is in your mouth. And the way you release the word of God is the way it's going to operate in your life. The way you release it is how it's going to operate. Some say the way I release it is how it's going to operate. Do not delay your blessings. Do not delay your healing. Do not delay your victory. Because we're spinning our wheels, believing the enemy who's acting that he defies us. Okay. Look at your enemy and says, You got the ability. Look at your friends. Look at your neighbor. Look at your wife. Look at your husband. Say, You got the ability. Go. 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 And this is one thing that's hard for us to understand. See, we see ourselves sitting west. Right here? Or you sitting here? Or you sitting here? Well, I'm not. Okay? And then you sit. Okay? And where do you see yourself? Sitting west. And sit. The Bible says, Mama, that you have to be there. The Bible says you sit at the right hand of the front. We gotta change how we see the word of God. You're sitting here. Somebody said, I'm sitting here, but I'm actually at the right hand of the throne next to his son, where his son is making intercession for me. See, we occupy the seats where we go, our drive the car. We go to the movies, we go to the games. Right? You want the best seats in the house. In the house of God, you got the best seat after. It's better than the front row. Imagine, Mama, you're sitting at the right hand of the throne where his son, Jesus Christ, is making intercession for you. What a beautiful place. Have you ever thought about that one? Have you ever seen it that way? Oh. Why? Say, why, Pastor? Because we as the church try to condemn us and hold us back, fighting the enemy instead of teaching people the ability and potential of God that's in your life. It's time for us to start teaching one another the potential of God. How God can restore a relationship. How God can win the job. How can God, God bless you here and God bless you there? Thank God for grace and mercy. Yeah. I felt like it, say for myself. Yeah. Today when I was praying, I was telling you, when I opened up today, God said, can't you just be grateful? Just be grateful. Can you just be grateful? Maybe five. Maybe five for a long time. I said, man, am I really grateful? Who's going to be here? With this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God, mm -hmm. from henceforth expecting till his enemies remained in Christ's He was sent to God in Christ's feet. Yeah, this is crazy. Jesus said that he died, he left that right side. The name of the right hand of the throne, he said, I'm going to sit here and say everything that the enemy did is that he might have sit. In other words, he's looking down in heaven. 
They look at them and look over that, looking at the situation. They're going to pass through the situation. They're going to pass through the thing. I go to this, I go to that. They're angry this, they're angry that. He's still waiting until you put that under the footstool. Because that's the only thing that's going to be laid. The footstool. Because if the immature hang up that I have, they're going to have to be able to hang up that I have. Because of the lack that I have, and I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about lack, spiritual lack. Spiritual lack. Our family suffered today. Our family suffered today. Because of the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge. The lack of the potential. Our ability. Look at your name and say, you know you have ability? Tell your man, you know you have potential? We need it. I need it. You need it. See, when God gives us a body like this, there's no potential to give us all the Is it your church get us to that destination? No. Nope. nope. The sheep of the shepherd were brought in and they used the wool to make room. In other words, you guys have sheep we're getting part of the pastor. We go hand in hand. But we at the church, we have a tendency to sit back here and say, that's not that's, that's pastor. He's going to get it there. No, he's not. We pray he does. But our pastor used to tell me, I can't wait for you, Ruben. i got to get there. i got to get there. we got no time to wait no more. The Bible makes it clear in the book of Revelation that the things that are going to come and get to come, that we can be able to do. Somebody said, COVID was a lovely thing. Somebody said, the next one's worse because we found it. We found a vaccine for it. That means the next one that comes is going to be a lot harder. But the Bible makes it clear we are a sign. Of the magic. Oh my God. Look at the thousands and thousands of people that are driving from COVID. I said, Don't look at the thousands of that. Look at that they found a vaccine for it. Which means that the next picture that comes through is going to be worse. But he's a new other thing. That my son is near. Here's the message. And you and I are representing the kingdom of heaven. You represent what? The kingdom of heaven. The neighbor? Did you know you represent the kingdom of heaven? Come on. Keep on. The coming of him, our king, mm-hmm. the light of God comes in and no longer can be can be enemy. In other words, he cannot defeat you no more. In other words, he can't get you no more, yeah? As much as he comes, the only way he can get to you is you give in. I've asked you to tell me, you know what, Ruben? If I get to heaven and just with one leg and I drag in, I made it. <laughs> but every day he does see you know, on this earth, I'm going to keep going for it. But I'm going to make you in. I said, Pastor, am I going to make it in? He said, you get in, Ruben, and you're probably going to be so much smoking because you barely got in. Huh. He was teaching like that because he wanted me to push. Push. You need to start pushing yourself. This day, there's no way that we can have a Sunday night, Sunday night service and have this church full. And they come on Wednesday and they're having a Sunday day. There's something wrong with it. <clears throat> and it has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with the leadership. It has to do with us. Our spiritual maturity. Do you want it? People are the leadership of the church when I was at the men, the top pastor. <clears throat> I don't need to sign the church. Okay? I don't need to be in church. Okay? 
Okay. He wouldn't call, he wouldn't fight for me. Two or three weeks later, there was some hunter chasing us. We're going to walk in. He said, what do you think? What do you think you were there? What do you think you forgot in yourself? The faith that you trusted in yourself. And I'm not saying this to be insulting. I'm saying this to be a concept to come up. A concept has to even come up. A concept has to even come up. My wife said something to me that really hurt me. She said, you would be a darn good pastor. So you wouldn't be so easily influenced. Okay. Well, if you get caught up in all that stuff, then you can do that stuff for you. That's a hindrance to your mature to the children. See, if you keep getting stuff out, sooner or later, it's going to wipe you out. So calm down. But we need people like that in our lives. We need people that in our lives. The Lord spoke about a few weeks ago. Stop. Come over that. Stop whatever you're doing. Just stop. Stop. Pastor, you just stop. God wants to do some things in our lives. The Bible says, don't let your goodness be evilly spoken of. Don't let everything that God has poured into you be spoken back. Don't walk out of the house as a pastor and be a fool in the parking lot. That's what my wife told me. Don't walk out of that church and be a pastor and then become a fool in the parking lot. Why? Because we're, we're easily persuaded. We, 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 a couple of paragraphs ago, we're talking about the struggle around us. How many want to make it? Let me help you out. We want to make it to heaven. How many want to make it while you're here? Yeah. Yeah. How many want to make it while you're here? Yeah. How many want to be the house owner while you're here? How many yeah. want to be the car owner while you're here? Yeah. How many want the best family while you're here? Uh-huh. Somebody told my pastor just recently. He said, he said, you know, John, that's the thing, is looking down on me? He said, no. He said, I promise you, Ruben, when you guys get to heaven, you're going to forget everything that's down here. He said, how do you know? So the Bible says, instantly you're transported into the glorified body. You identify the people that don't have the same thing in front of Guess what? You don't have to wait for the heaven to drop our body. You do it here. <clears throat> That's why the scripture says no weapon formed against us. That prophecy. What do you think? He didn't say there will be no weapon. He said there ain't a weapon that's going to prophesy. In other words, get yourself ready. Get yourself ready. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. That's what that scripture means. It doesn't mean it's not going to be fun. It's that it won't prosper. But if I'm not in the proper place, I'm supposed to be. Somebody said, that's key. Where are you supposed to be tonight? In the things of God. That's a question for you to take home. And I'm going to take that home for me too. Where am I supposed to be? Where am I supposed to be? God has blessed us. How many have been blessed by God? How many have been blessed by God? Blessed by God. Every day. Every day. God is an every day. Mom, you woke up. You say that evil things go to my mind when I mean evil things? When I say evil things, did you know God is evil? God contradicts the things that God said he's going to do. So when you say, I doubt what you're saying is, I believe the enemy more than I believe God. That's not a bad word to believe the God. You believe. And this day will come. Believe the word of God. Know your enemy. Know the character. 
The Bible says, Know them that labor among you. Know them that labor among you. My pastor says, Know them that labor among you. You're not talking just in the church, you're talking about the job, where you live, the places you hang out at, the people that are in your life. What's their reasoning? What purpose do they have in your life? Are they building your family up? Are they tearing you down? Are they building you up? Are they tearing you down? And the issue is today is the enemy uses people. He cannot defeat God. He's defeated. But he uses people. To know them, to know them, their neighbors among you. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Mama.